we're going to look at uh, the paragraph that comes right after this one, namely 115 to 18, and the question of this painful and strange situation of people who are preaching Christ from envy and rivalry in order to make Paul feel miserable, thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Father, I pray that as we look at what this must have meant for Paul and how he dealt with not only being in prison but being betrayed and treated so despicably by those who were outside the prison to make him feel bad inside the prison, would you give us understanding of of how professing Christians, or maybe even real Christians, can treat each other this way and protect us from it? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go back and just get the context here. Here's 1, 12 to 14 in Philippians. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me and that's this imprisonment here, what has happened to me, has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are more bold to uh, speak the word without fear. And we've spent a couple of sessions on that. So the main point there is, in spite of prison, Paul is uh, not dominated by fear and wants to point out that it is all working for the advancement of the gospel, both in the sense that the imperial guard has heard that his imprisonment is for Christ and that it has made Christians more bold. And then we get this second bleak situation, not only prison, but look, what happens to, to Paul from those outside prison? Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. But the former, these rascals, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. That's not the same word as this word rivalry. It's translated rivalry in the in the uh, ESV for some reason. It, this word right here is the same as the word in chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition. They're not sincere, and they're trying to afflict Paul in his imprisonment. So just think of it. Paul is not facing the fact that he's being prevented from preaching by being imprisoned. He's got... Um, are they Christians? I don't even know. Maybe. Um, but they're envious of Paul? Why would that be? Well, Paul's a newcomer to Rome, and maybe these people have been working hard for several years. And here comes this f foreigner, this Johnny-come-lately, and he is being touted as the great apostle, and they've fallen into the shadows. And now he's in prison, and they... They're preaching out of envy and rivalry and selfish ambition in order to make him feel bad. Now, I tried to imagine, can you imagine a situation where that might be? And I thought of a situation like this. Um, two pastors, not in their best form, um, and one of them is envious of the other. Perhaps the other one, his church is growing and people are excited about it. It's the talk of the town. And, and this pastor's feeling a selfish ambition and a rivalry and envy. And then the pastor who is feeling that way gets invited to a big prayer gathering and the other pastor is passed over. Nobody, have, and nobody invites him. He's not even noticed. And this pastor says, yes, I'll do it. I'll pray at the big event. And all the while, he's thinking, ha, I got asked to pray and the other one didn't. That would be an example, I think, of the horrible attitude 
that is uh, flowing out of envy and rivalry and selfish ambition. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Why does Paul mention it here? Well, it seems strange. I mean, he, he's, he's talking to the Philippians. They're, they only know what's going on in Rome where he is because of what he tells them. And he tells them this awful situation and, and puts the, the, the church perhaps in a, in a bad light here, at least some of the people. Why, why does he do that? And isn't the answer first that one of his main points in this letter, we're going to see in chapter 2, is do nothing from rivalry. Do nothing from selfish ambition. This same word, this selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So one of the big points of this letter is going to be, don't be like, don't be like these people in Philippians 1, 15. And I think a, a second reason why he wants to tell the church in Philippi, what's going on is because not only is prison overcome and turned for good, but so is this selfish ambition. These brothers, he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. So Paul's whole point here is, I'm telling you this bad news so that you can see, in my view, I am thrilled that the gospel is going forth. The bottom line for Paul is not that things are going well for him. He's in prison, and he's being afflicted by these brothers, and he says, no problem. In every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Let's take a take a look at verse uh, verse sixteen here. These are the good guys. The latter, the ones who are being made bold by Paul's imprisonment, the latter do it out of love. They're preaching out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. In other words, they, they want Paul to look at them and feel good, not feel afflicted, feel good because Paul loves the gospel. And so they're going to be boldly doing what Paul can't do so that Paul will be encouraged. And I noticed, did you notice, love, they're doing it out of love, knowing. Does that trigger anything? Here's the prayer. A few verses earlier, it is my prayer for that your love, the Philippians, your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Paul's desire is that people, the people he's writing to and the people he works with, live in love and that this love be guided and strengthened by knowledge. And so when I read few verses later, these preachers are preaching out of love, knowing something. I realize that the kind of knowing that guides love is not just knowing things about Christ, but knowing things about people, that Paul is in prison for the gospel, and knowing that fills them with how they're going to love him by preaching the gospel. One last point. What is the bottom line of this whole unit? Indeed, the one just before it and this one. Isn't the bottom line, what then? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, whether I'm in prison or not, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice Paul's great passion is the gospel. 
and Christ magnified through it, and that's therefore the ground of his joy. I mean, in the very next verses, he's going to say, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or death. His great passion was Christ magnified. And so here he says, what then? I've got enemies, I'm in prison, only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I find my joy. Oh, that God would make us love the gospel, make us love the magnifying of Christ more than we love our own freedom or our own being treated well by other people.